to all gathered. I greet you in the wonderful name of our to all those who are online. We thank you for tuning in as well. I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday morning service and even as we gather our hearts right now to worship our King, let's pray that our minds and our hearts will be settled and focused onto Him. So before we have our scripture, which is taken from Psalm 92 verses 1 to 5, I'd like to ask our pastor Francis Warner if he could open us in a word of prayer. Morning, let's pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that as we reflect on who you are and who we are, we ask ourselves, you know, who are we that you should be mindful of us? But Lord, we know because of your grace and love that you've extended yourself to us. And so with gratitude, Lord, we receive it this morning. Lord, as we focus on you this morning, we pray that you would guard our thoughts and our minds, that you would help us to really be focused on you, not on ourselves, not on any situation, but to honor you and to receive from you from your word and from fellowship and from the time of worship together. Be glorified. Be lifted up, Lord. For, Lord, indeed, you have made us glad. You have given us a joy and a peace and a hope that this world can't understand. And so, Lord, we bless you. Thank you for your death, Jesus. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you that you live in us, that you reign forever. We worship you. Bless the time of worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'd like to read the scripture, which is taken from Psalm 92. And it says, It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. To proclaim to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp, for you, for you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. How profound are your thoughts. And indeed, God has made us glad. And we are glad that we have the opportunity to fellowship with him. He is holy. He is high. He is lifted up. And so, let us be encouraged by the scripture to make beautiful music unto him through our hearts. We are here to sing, to worship our Father. And so even as you stand, as we continue to look back at the goodness of God and how he has been faithful in our lives, we just want to honor him this morning. So stand as we sing, make me glad.
That God is near. He's our very present help in time of need. Holy are you, Lord. We are here to lift our hands and to give God the highest note of praise this morning. Let us just focus on Him. Let us focus on Him. Focus on the character of who He is. As we are here together, as we sing for joy, for the Lord is our strength. Worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He. We stand 
of God's goodness towards us. Today and forevermore, we will continue to proclaim his name, how great he is. He has given us breath, he has given us life, and the least we could do is glorify his name this morning. So let us just continue to focus on him as we honor him this morning. This is indeed the air we breathe. We are desperate for him. We continue to magnify his name. We are lost, totally lost without you, O oh God. Oh God. And this is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your Living in me. 
me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. This is my daily
ask that you would just take us, oh Father God, mold us and shape us, oh Father God, to be what and who you want us to be in you, oh Father God. So Father God, even as we humble ourselves and we pray and we trust that you would continue to shape and mold us, we pray, oh God, that you would indeed take control, oh Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We glorify your name this today. Hallelujah. You are indeed worthy of it all. You are indeed worthy of it all. Hallelujah. And so, you may have your seats as we go into a time of prayer. And we would like to pray for our country. We would like to pray for the offering and those who will be sitting SEA. So I'd like to ask Karen if he could pray for the country and offering and Martin if he could pray for those who will be sitting SEA this coming Thursday. Father in heaven, we give you thanks, Lord. We thank you that you are God and you are Lord over all of us. We thank you, God, that you have given us this life that we can give back to you. And Lord, we just thank you that you are our God and there's none like you, O oh God. And Father, we just lift up our country, Trinidad and Tobago, before you. And we pray, O oh God, that you will reign over this country. We pray, God, that you will have mercy upon us as a people. We pray, O oh God, that we will continue to live in harmony and in peace. We pray, O oh God, that our government will continue to rule and rule with wisdom and understanding. We pray, O oh God, that your people will continue to be a people of, of understanding and peace. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that your peace will reign over all of us, and in, in each of us. Lord, we pray, oh God, that we continue to be kind to each other and to be understanding to each other. Lord, we just thank you, and we also ask you, oh God, that as, our, as we give back to you, Lord God, in offering and in tithes, Lord, we pray, oh God, that you'll use it for the furtherance of our kingdom. And Lord, we pray, oh God, that as we give, we'll give not grudgingly, but cheerfully. And we pray, O oh God, that it will be in your wisdom that we will continue to be as a people that is, is worthy of your calling. And Lord God, we just thank you for each and every one of us here today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Lord, remember our children, the little ones among us who you love. And as dear God, they are prepared for this milestone with SEA coming up on Thursday. We pray that you will cover them with your peace, cover them with your wisdom, cause them, dear God, to be relaxed and not be anxious. That which they would have learned over the years will come, will be fulfilled in these exams, dear Father. We pray also for the teachers, the parents, the school administrators, that they may not exert unnecessary pressure on these children, dear Father, but allow them to express themselves, dear Father, in the best way they can. We pray, dear God, for good results, for good reports, particularly those among us, dear Father, we want to pray specifically for them. They have labored very hard over the years, dear Father. So we pray that you will continue to bless them, continue to keep them, dear Father. And as the results await, dear Father, we will give you thanks in advance. So bless and keep them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So right now, I'd like to open the floor for anyone who has a burning testimony that they'd like to share. If so, um, we would graciously, yes, yeah, so we have um, our sister Sharon. morning everybody well my testimony may seem simple to um to those hearing but for me it is just a miracle totally miraculous and awesome work of god so um at work i feel i tell people when they ask me how work is going i say i'm breathing through a clogged straw and there's only a small part that is allowing me to have air that's how overwhelmed it is and how overwhelming it continues to be and I had a deliverable that only God could have intervened in and made possible because there was no way I could add on 18 additional days to the month. And that was how long I needed to get it done. And God did just that. Not to this month, but to months to come. The unit that I was to deliver to, they said absolutely no extension. They were going to be disbanded, so there, were this, it, there would be no staff there to accept my deliverable. I had to get it done, and it was impossible. And I just handed it over to God, and he has been teaching me to stay still. I've been sharing with those of you who talked to me that I had a quote that I've been really um, living by and really powerful, where it says, um, God has everything under control. He doesn't need any advice or help from me. And so I've been doing that and just paying attention and obeying. And I've been putting it in prayer. And my supervisor came this week to tell me that the entity who said we had to deliver by the end of March is now saying that it's okay, we can deliver the end of June. That is a miracle. I don't know who is in the place sitting down to accept my, my deliverable, but I will get it done and deliver it to who God has placed there. And I just want to just thank God. I am still in awe of that work. And I'm still just absolutely, you know, when he does something miraculous, he just knock you for six and you're still trying to recover. Yeah, I'm still in recovery mode. And I just praise him with you this morning. Amen. Well, we thank God for that. Um, now we'd like to have the announcements by our pastor. Good morning again. Before I start the announcements, I don't know about you, but one of my pet peeves is if somebody is, is talking, that somebody just, just stands up. Announcement number one. On Friday, March 29th, Good Friday, SABC presents Heaven or Hell? Where will you spend eternity beginning at 6.45 p.m.? Please invite your family, friends, fellow workers, schoolmates, and neighbors to see and hear the gospel in a dramatic way. On Sunday, March 24th, that's next Sunday, 
we'll be going into the surrounding community to distribute flyers and invite folks to attend. And a reminder to all cast and crew members at 6 p.m. today, promptly, not 6.01, 6 p.m., there is a practice for the entire cast and crew. As I was saying, I just can't stand. And I'm saying number two. ABC has a wonderful Easter camp 2024 for children and teenagers at Victory Heights running on the weekend of Friday, March 22nd to Sunday, March 24th. Junior camp is for seven years to 11 years and costs $350. Senior camp is from 12 years old and up and costs $375. Please speak to Ella Jo Keterson today if you are interested in going. If anyone is interested in counseling at the camp, please let Elder Joe know as well. Okay. I still want to say that I can't stand... Announcement number three. The Caribbean Diaspora Initiative presents Transforming the Region and Impacting the World for Christ. It is online and will start at 9 a.m. on Saturday, March 30th. Our own Marcel Mapp will be one of the presenters. The link will be put on the SABC broadcast so you can register. Even my wife? <laughs> but I still have to say, I can't stand... Sex is the Sunday is on Saturday, March 31st. Area groups will be shifted to the first Sunday in April the 7th. Please take note of the change of date. But I still have to get it out. I can't stand. Announcement number five. Classes for those wishing to be baptized start on Sunday, March 24th, Sunday coming at 11.30 a.m. during the Sunday school time. There will be two classes, one for preteens and teenagers and one for adults. If anyone is interested in being part of these classes, please give your name to either Sister Marcel Mapp, can you please stand, or Sister Sharon Rose. Can you all stand so people can see who to give their names to? Thank you. Hmm. Well, if I can't stand, it's best I just go and sit down. <laughs> Right. So at this time, we'd like to welcome our visitors. Um, do we have any visitors here with us who are here with us for the first time or for those members who have not here, have, who have not been here with us for a long time? If you could just stand and uh, say your name and where you're from. I'm Piram Jag from Evans Street. Hi, good morning. My name is Anne Marie Hickson. I bring you greetings from Overcoming Power Bible Way Church in Maryland. And I am here this morning. My aunt is Monica Vendor Williams or Williams Vendor, whichever way she wants to put it. And this is my second time being, well, third time because I've joined you before via Zoom um, during COVID, and I was like, oh my God, I want to visit this church. And God has made a way. So I enjoyed the service. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Hui from Shogonis, back <laughs> after a while. Um, I'm back with Hope, and now Hannah, number two. And also, my immediate family, my parents and my sister, are visiting us for a short period. <laughs> so, mom, dad, and sister. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Zakia, and I came with my mom. Well, we warmly welcome each and every one of you. We thank you so much for visiting us. And we have a special lady in blue <laughs> if you could just yes hi my name is Shadi 
You all should probably know me. If you don't know me, hi, nice to meet you for the first time. I live in Hull, which is in Yorkshire, which nobody knows where that is. Um, and I'm happy to be with all of you and to see all of you again. Well, welcome back, Shadi. All right, so now we would like to have the scripture reading. Um, it's going to be read by Chanon, and the scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 17, and then James 5, verse 7 to 20. Yes? All right, good morning again. All right, so beginning with Matthew 8. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched the hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Now to James 5, 7 to 20. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the faith of su suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else, let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. Amen. We thank God for his word. So even as we stand again, let's just sing that song, Jehovah, you are the most high. God is indeed good and his mercies endure it forever. Amen.
glorify your name this morning oh god you are indeed the most high we have so many reasons to lift our hands to be thankful for and even and even as we continue to give back to you with our finances as we collect this morning's offering we pray that you would continue to be the most high that you would be number one the center of it all we worship you today Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never. Sing back now. 
the sun comes up, the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. to trust in that name, Jesus. Oh God, just to take him at his word. Hallelujah. And tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest.
Father God, we worship you, O oh God. We pray that you would be lifted up in our lives, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our country, in this world. We pray, O oh God, that you would be lifted up. O oh God, we pray, O oh God, that you would be first and foremost, O oh God, the center of it all. That as we decrease, you will increase. Oh God, so we give you the highest note of praise this morning, oh Father God. As we continue to glorify your name, as we continue to magnify your name, as we continue to lift not only our hearts, our spirits, our souls, we lift our hands before you, oh God. We bow before you this morning, oh Father. We ask you that you would forgive us when we did not put you first, O oh God. Take control, O oh God. For you indeed are worthy. You are worthy of it all. O oh God, we praise you. And even as your servant comes to give your word, we pray, O oh God, that it would strike us, O oh God that it would penetrate our hearts, oh Father. We pray, oh God, even for the young ones who may go off to junior church, oh God, that your word would be hidden in their hearts, oh Father God, even now. So God, we glorify your name. We thank you, God, for your unfailing character, for who you are, and we praise you. Hallelujah. You may have your seats as we welcome Uncle Joe. This morning we are looking at following the example of Jesus in his healing and deliverance ministries. And 
have taken Matthew chapter 8 and James 5 as the basis for what I'm about to present. It is said that our health is our greatest wealth. Without it, all else loses value. I see a doctor in the front row smiling at me. <laughs> that makes it a major concern of every individual and a major topic of conversation. So how are you doing? Everything all right? I'm praying for you to feel better. How can I help? Such expressions of concern can mean a lot to anyone who is not in the best of health. Because along with ill health often comes depression, discouragement, and we find ourselves open to any encouragement or help that we can get. As disciples of Jesus, we need to show compassion for those in need. Because this is what Jesus did. And we can find guidance for doing this in Jesus' example, Job's experience, and James's instructions. So we have a, a triple focus this morning. Jesus left us an example of compassion and concern for others. While Job showed us how to patiently trust God in adversity. And James pointed us to the power of prayer. And we want to look at that, that balance. I, I, I wanted to bring that because not, not just one side. Just, let's look at other sides of the, of the picture. So first of all, Jesus' example. Matthew 8, 1 to 17. There is something really marvelous and you know, raises your paws, you know, when you see Jesus in action in the pages of the Gospels. Jesus' actions and reactions in the Gospels kind of just blow your mind. He, he, he seems to know exactly what to do in every situation. Every situation. Chapter 8 is like a day in the life. It starts off with a leper kneeling before Jesus and saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So what does Jesus do? He says, I am willing. Be clean. And he touches him. And that's not the end of the story. I, I thought this was a little portion added on here was significant. He told him, go and see the priest. Let him know what has happened. Make the offering required for your cleansing and get yourself sorted out. In keeping with the law. In keeping with the law. So he's saying that I, I heal you, so everything, okay, you still have to go and follow what the law requires. Then a Roman centurion comes to Jesus and asks him to heal his servant who is at home sick. Basically, he's asking Jesus to heal somebody who he has not seen, who he cannot touch, who he doesn't know, who is somewhere. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> you know? I don't think in, in the passage you get the impression that 
he tells him, well, he's on, the, on this street in this house, and he's upstairs in the right-hand bedroom, <laughs> you know? He just tells him, he's home, and he's sick. I believe you can heal him. Jesus' first response is, I will go with you. And the man said, no, 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 that's not necessary. That's not necessary. I'm accustomed to giving orders. I'm a, a man who is in authority. I know what that means. You just say the word. Jesus said the word. And the man was healed. But Jesus also commended that man's faith. He said, I haven't seen faith like this in Israel. You know? And this was a Gentile. This was a Gentile. So I haven't seen faith like this in Israel. Later, he goes to visit Peter's home. Finds Peter's mother-in-law in bed with a fever. They point this out to him and so on. And he goes and touches on her hand. She gets up and she goes and starts cooking. <laughs> she immediately goes to the kitchen and starts cooking. Hey, Lauren? <laughs> Marvelous. Later on that same evening, many people come bringing sick people, demon-possessed people to him, and he healed all of them. All of them. Clearly, following Jesus' example in healing is a hard act. To follow. Very difficult act to follow. But right here, Matthew sticks in a little comment. He says that this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53 4. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Speaking of Christ, identifying with us, sensitive to our struggles, our weaknesses, our problems, and even providing help, providing solutions. In other accounts, we see Jesus instantaneously healing people who were crippled or blind or deaf and dumb from birth. Interestingly, if someone is crippled or blind or deaf and dumb from birth, maybe initially in childhood, they are maybe to that, that is the end of that. especially when it's from birth. Congenital diseases are the most, it, it, there's very little that can be done in those cases. But here we see Jesus healing them. Sometimes it boggles my mind. Imagine <laughs> you deaf and dumb from birth and Jesus heal you. What will you say? <laughs> what will you say? The man who was blind, he's, he's, say, he's seeing things like sticks, <laughs> like trees walking, you know. And gradually, he was able to realize what was happening around him. Christ identified with us in his life and brought us physical healing we see that identification standing out in the death of Lazarus, where he got to Lazarus' graveside and he wept. Jesus wept. I'm sure he knew 
Because he told them before. Right? In fact, some of the other disciples were a little bit annoyed with him that he didn't go back before Lazarus died. And when he decided to go back after Lazarus died, Thomas said, okay, let's go and die with him. <laughs> because there was a lot of opposition and, and difficulties at that time. All right? But he knew what was happening. But still, he so sympathized and empathized and related to the emotions of the situation that we are told in John chapter 11 that Jesus wept. But Isaiah 53 also speaks about Jesus bearing our sins, our transgressions, our iniquities, our spiritual sickness, and bringing us salvation, spiritual healing that ultimately includes an end to all sin and suffering death and mourning, weeping. All of this in keeping with Revelation 21, 3 and 4 and Romans 8, 18. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from the bondage of decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So this life that we live and the sorrows and the disappointments and the complexities are part of this current order of things. So I'm saying all of that because there, is, there are many who say that in the atonement, we are given the, we are given healing in the sense that after Christ's atonement, if you are sick, it's because you have not accepted the healing that he has brought. Just like if you're not saved, you haven't accepted his salvation. So you're sick, you haven't accepted his healing. But the scriptures talk about a new order that Christ is going to bring in when he returns. Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. A portion that we know very well because we kind of waiting on it, you know? We're kind of longing for it to come here. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. When Christ returns to rule, the new order will be ushered in. We will have new bodies and we will not have that constant struggle with sin and sickness and suffering. The Gospels also tell us that Jesus' miracles were signs. And signs always point to something. 
they were pointing to Jesus' unique person and mission. He was the Son of God, the promised Messiah, here to bring us hope and salvation, here to usher in the gospel and God's forgiveness and blessing as promised in the Old Testament. The miracles also helped his disciples to see him for who he was and to grow in their own faith and confidence in him. Jesus' ultimate command to us, his followers, were Love one another as I have loved you. A call to show his love and compassion. He also said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. To declare the good news of salvation. God's favor towards men granting salvation. And he also said, I am with you to the very end of the age. So in following Jesus' example, we proclaim the good news of salvation. We baptize and teach those who believe while ministering to practical needs in Jesus' name, not in the church's name, not in our own name, in Jesus' name. You remember the apostles at the gate beautiful, silver and gold have I none, but that which I have, I'll give to you. Rise in the name of Jesus. So we declare the name of Jesus. We declare the power of Jesus. We proclaim hope and salvation in Jesus' name. We call upon his power to heal and deliver. In his name. And we freely give what we have freely received. Helping others to grow in faith. For this purpose, Christ has also given the church spiritual gifts. Among them are gifts of healing, distinguishing between spirits, and many others. And he says to us, as he said in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Not in ourselves, but a reflection of the light that he has brought into our lives. So we let our good deeds shine out for all those around us to see so that everyone will know and praise our Heavenly Father. But James brings another little facet or aspect of the Matter interview. James 5, verses 7 to 12, the first half of it, encourages us to have patience in suffering, standing firm 
as we await the Lord's return. So we realize that the things that we experience in this time are not the end of, it, of all things. I remember hearing a, a preacher say that God has given us many promises and some of them will be paid in heavenly currency. <laughs> we may not see it on earth. But we stay firm awaiting the Lord's return because that is when Jesus' promises will all be fulfilled and all sin and suffering will cease. And the passage points us to the example of the prophets and of Job who suffered for their faith. Job trusted God in spite of the loss of his family and all his possessions. He trusted God in spite of a physical illness that was horrendous. He had to get away from people, sit down in an ash heap and scrape the boils on his skin. And as you read Job, you realize one of the concerns that Job had in the midst of all of this, he's trusting God to do something, to, to show him what, what this is all about. But at one time, he starts to get afraid. Hey, <laughs> I'm not going to survive this. I'm not going to survive this. I don't think I'm going to make, this, make it through this. But, but, I know my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. It's amazing to consider that Job is one of the oldest books in the Old Testament. It reflects a time in parallel with Abraham and the patriarchs and, 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 and so on and a clear understanding of what God is doing sustained Job. Even when everything else looked crazy and he couldn't understand what was going on, his faith in God stayed firm. He's an example to us of patient endurance in the midst of trials. In the end, God honored Job vindicated his trust by speaking to him. I mean, that, that to my, all the way along he's saying, well, you know, I want to talk to God. I mean, I have a case. I wish I just had a chance to put my case to God. So God said, okay, let me talk to you. And Job, at the end of Job, he says, I shut up. <laughs> there was absolutely nothing that I could say, or I wanted to say. He didn't only speak to him and show him his glory. He restored to him beyond what he had lost. Everyone who is sick wants to get better. But we need to bear in mind that there are things to be learned through suffering. At the beginning of Job, God says he was a righteous man. In fact, as much as Job had faith in God, it's interesting to consider that God had faith in Job. Have you seen my servant Job? And just as Job maintained his faith in God, God maintained his faith in Job and cared for him and provided for him through this whole experience. But there's a transition in Job from the beginning to the end. And one of the transitions is so obvious that sometimes we overlook it. Job, full of words, <laughs> you know, 
from the beginning to the end. He can't stop talking. Full of words. When he finally sees, when I finally see his God, <laughs> he has nothing to say. He covers his mouth. He has nothing that he can say. We see a greater level. Even though he knew God, even though he feared God, at the end of it all, we see an even higher level of understanding and submission and appreciation of who God is. And his position or his standing before God. And if you're not satisfied with Job, James himself says it. James 1, 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The struggles of life teach us. Well, they are supposed to teach us. They are supposed to teach us. And there's a sense in which when we don't learn our lessons, the same thing happens as in school. The teacher sends us back to do it over. <laughs> we find ourselves doing it over and over and over until we learn that lesson and spin out of it. Yeah. An example of that is in Israel itself. At the drop of a hat, Israel would run after foreign gods and do all sorts of things that didn't please God. The gods of the Canaanites, the Baals, the gods of Babylon. The, you know, the... They had a, a kind of a very generous outlook, you know. Whatever God is out there, let's make him happy. <laughs> but after they spent some time in Babylon and they saw gods, when they went back into captivity, they became much, much more circumspect. So much so that the Roman eagle was not allowed to enter the temple in Jerusalem. They, they had to leave it outside. Although Rome was the conquering, it would be a riot if they were to bring that into the temple. So they learned from what was going on. So too, we need to learn. And when people are ill, sometimes there is something in them, in there, that they need to learn. When people are suffering, when people are struggling, sometimes there's something in there to be, for them to learn. Even Jesus, the scripture tells us. Hebrews 2, 10, and chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once more made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus, who was sinless, suffered 
in order to obey God's will and to secure our salvation. Some suffering is in God's will, is in keeping with God's will. Even Paul, the Apostle Paul, he received a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble and dependent on God's grace. God told him, my grace is sufficient. Towards the close of this portion, James chapter 5, 7 to 12, James acknowledges that some of our sufferings are due to the actions of others. But he still tells us not to grumble, but to love and help each other because the Lord, the judge, is at the door, is at hand. COVID-19 was a reminder to all of us of our common humanity and our mutual interdependence. That small but lethal virus was no respecter of gender, race, color, creed, nationality, anything. And it prevailed where we failed to protect ourselves or to protect others. In fact, exactly what James says here, one of our first reactions to COVID-19 was to grumble. Lots of old talk. Lots of grumbling. But in the end, it was compassion, selfless service, prevailing prayer that made the difference. And it will always make a difference when we are full of compassion and mercy like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It will always make a difference. And you notice the issue here is not about who right or wrong. <laughs> As they say, I don't want to know. I don't care how much you know. I want to know how much you care. We need to care for one another. We are our brother's keeper. Finally, James, in 5... 13 to 18, brings a, not a new, but a slightly different perspective. James was not an apostle or even a disciple during Jesus' lifetime. He came to faith after the resurrection. Corinthians tells us that Jesus appeared to him. He was one of the people that Jesus appeared to when he rose. Imagine your brother, you were there when your brother was crucified and buried, and the next thing he's knocking on your door. <laughs> you know? I want to talk to you. <laughs> so that was an awesome experience for James, and James went on to become a leader in the church in Jerusalem. In this last portion, he brings in the role of the church and the role of prayer in this whole issue of serving and dealing with healing and deliverance. And he reminds us of an Old Testament staple. It comes up again and again in the Old Testament. Jesus says to the children of Israel, I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. If you listen to my commands and all of the, none of the diseases that you see falling upon the Egyptians and other nations will fall upon you.
there's a place for prayer and obedience in the whole issue of health and wellness. The shalom of God, the peace of God. But then he makes another point, which is a point that we, 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 we must, must, must remember. Access to God in prayer and worship, praise and thanksgiving, are our most powerful resource. We have access to the all-powerful God. The God of creation. The God of salvation. The God of the end times. The God of the fulfillment of all the promises. We have access to him in prayer and worship. Praise and thanksgiving. This is our most powerful resource as the people of God. To be used on our behalf, to be used on the behalf of the world, to be used on the behalf of people who don't even want to know God. The challenge is for us to use it. So he tells us that prayer and worship is appropriate at all times and in all situations. The leaders in the church have a priestly role to perform in praying and anointing the sick. Anointing had a kind of a twofold Meaning in, in that day, it was a question of consecration. It was also a question of uh, a healing mechanism. I'm not sure exactly which one. Maybe both of them was being implied here. But the action of the leadership, the concern of the leadership, the intervention of the leadership, God's representatives in a situation considered here critical. The prayer of faith would raise the person up. A prayer based on a clear understanding of God's word, guidance of God's spirit, the assurance of God that this is his will and purposes. But it is also said that the prayer of the individual member, the individual believer, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Useful for our own situations as well as the situations of others. God continues to manifest his love and power through the church. So the prayer meeting as Calvin always reminds us, is the engine room of the church. The prayer meeting is the engine room of the church. In which about 25 of us meet every week and try to carry the whole church on our backs. We need your help. We need your help. It's only an hour, hour and a half. We pray for the needs that are presented. We pray for the needs that we see in the world around us. And God is a caring, a loving God. And he answers prayer. He heals. He delivers. He transforms. He manifests himself and his power and his presence in the midst of his people. In response to the prayers of his people. Based on the guidance of his word. 
So prayer should not be a last resort. Prayer is our first and main resource, not a last resort. And again, this is the example of Jesus, isn't it? He would get up every morning, early, go apart, and pray. He would teach his disciples to pray. At the raising of Lazarus, he said, Lord, I know you hear me, to the Father. I, I know you hear me. But I'm saying this for the benefit of all of those listening. <laughs> I'm praying to you for the benefit of all of those listening. Lazarus, come forth. But after all of that is said and done, I, 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 don't, I hope I'm not exaggerating or I'm not stretching the issue when the very last two verses of James chapter 5 bring us back to what I believe is the main issue. You see, some folks make as if, well, you, there's what you call the, the um, I forgot, liberation, liberation, I forget the term for it now, but they make as if the helping of people and the deeds of um, the good deeds and the actions that benefit society are at the top of the list. This reminds us that, my brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sin. The message of forgiveness the message of eternal life through Jesus Christ has priority over all. That is the ultimate benefit that we can have from Jesus' death and resurrection. There may be other things that we can get, but new life, eternal life, New hope in Christ. That is the ultimate benefit. So it is a complex issue. We are to follow Jesus' example. Show compassion. Show love. Point to him. We are not called to be another Jesus. We have one already. Yeah. We have to recognize that not all suffering is without use. Suffering is pointing us to things that we need to learn. And we need to major on prayer and worship and accessing God because it's a tremendous privilege a tremendous opportunity that we have. If we know God, if we can pray to God, and we neglect to pray on behalf of ourselves and those who call us friends, then we are badly, badly off. We are in a bad place. So that last emphasis from James, I think, is a very important one. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in prayer meeting on Wednesday. Amen? Okay, well, I didn't hear the amen, but I know you're thinking about it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for reminding us of your compassion, your love, your... Even leaving the glories of heaven and coming down to earth to share in our 
infirmities and our weaknesses to face our abuse so that you can identify with us, die for us, and bring us hope, bring us salvation, bring us back into a relationship with God. We thank you for this, Lord, and help us to be able, responsible disciples, proclaiming your love and power and goodness, taking on the concerns of those around us. Because our God can do something about it. Whether it be an illness or financial need or practical need or spiritual condition. Help us to be concerned, to be aware, to be willing to serve in your power and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's do Even as we are reminded to be compassionate towards one another and to bear and to be patient in adversity, let's sing, let's stand as we sing our closing song, I need you, you need me, I pray for you, you pray for me.
יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונך, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. May the peace of God be with you this week. A reminder that there is a Sunday school class for everyone and that I believe refreshments are on sale next door. So greet someone and be blessed. All right, you are dismissed. Again, we thank you for those who have joined us online. Um, God bless. <laughs>